Wow. And there is a word of Hawa unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy concerning shepherds of Israel. Prophesy, and thou hast said unto them, to the shepherds, thus said Hawa. To the shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. The flock do not the shepherds feed. The fat you do eat and the wool you put on. The fed one you slaughter. The flock you feed not. The weak you have not strengthened, and the sick one you have not healed. And the broken you have not bound up, and the driven away have not brought back, and the lost you have not sought, and with might you have ruled them, and with rigor. And they are scattered from want of a shepherd. And are for food to every beast of the field. Yea, they are scattered. Go astray to my flock. And all on all the mountains. And on every high hill. And on the face of the land. Have my flock been scattered. And there is none inquiring. And none seeking. Therefore shepherds. Hear a word of a while. I live in affirmation of Hawa, if not because of my flock being for a prey. Yea, my flock is for food to every beast of the field, because there is no shepherd. And my shepherds have not sought my flock, and the shepherds do feed themselves, and my flock they have not fed. Therefore, O shepherds, hear a word of Hawa. Thus says your power. I am against the shepherds. And have required my flock from their hand. And caused them to cease from feeding the flock. And no more do the shepherds feed themselves. And I have delivered my flock from their mouth. And they are not to them for food. For thus says Hawaii, I, even I, have required my flock, and I have sought it out as a shepherd searching of his drove in the day of his being in the midst of his scattered flock. So I do seek my flock. I have delivered them out of all places, whether they have been scattered in a cloud and thick darkness, and brought them out from the people, and have gathered them from the land. And brought them unto their own ground, and have fed them on mountains of Israel, by streams and by dwellings of the land. With good pasture I do feed them. And on mountains of high place of Israel is their habitation. There do they lie down in the good habitation and fat pastures they enjoy on the mountains of Israel. I feed my flock and cause them to lie down. An affirmation of Hawa. The lost I seek, and the driven away bring back, and the broken I bind up, and the sick I strengthen, and the fat and the strong I destroy. I feed it with judgment. And you, my flock, thus says Hawa, lo, I am judging between sheep and sheep. Between ram and he goats. Is it a little thing for you? The good pastor you enjoy?
and the remnant of your pasture you tread down with your feet, and the depth of waters you do drink, and the remainder with your feet you trample. And my flock, the trodden thing of your feet, consume it. And the trampled thing of your feet, you drink it. Therefore, says Hawah to them, I, even I, have judged between fat sheep and lean sheep. Because with side and with shoulder you thrust away. And with your horns push all the diseased till you have scattered them to the outplace. I have given safety to my flock and they are no more for prey. And I have judged between sheep and sheep and have raised up over them one shepherd and he hath fed them. My servant David, my servant David, my servant David, he does feed them, and he is their shepherd. And I, Hawaii, I am their power. Wow. Wow. And my servant David is prince in their midst. I, Hawaii, have spoken. Let go. This is Preston John, number 37. 38. I can't keep track. We just going, man. We just surfing away. Charlotte Wild family, man. We just chilling and drop, drop, chatter. Chat to chat, chatter. Kind of want some more of that water. Get some more of that water. These are the waters of you, dog, man. Love to my tribe. You know what I mean? The real ones, man. Um, you know, and keep flowing, man. Keep flowing. Keep flowing with the wave. Give me one more round. Give me one more round, man. Let like my brother Hakan Hiram say, man, twist up a lock for him, man. We one drop nation. We at it again. We're enjoying this investigation of part 38 of Preston John or the Noble Ethiopian. 
It's our personal flow. If you want to get personal with us, you can enjoy it. And uh, just be the water, man. You know, when you search for the priest king, you really got to be the water to know what's going on. Oh, man, I mean... We're just digging on some drop in the drop chatter. I'm over here. I'm just chilling, man. I'm chilling on my dolo. You know, I need my tribe in here, man. What's popping? <laughs> now it's like, uh, you know, 4 o'clock in the morning, man. I'm over here creeping through the drop, drop chatter. When I talk about high con, high mark, man, and we talk about con, what is a con? We're talking Wong Khan, Priest King. According to the Masoretic Hebrew text, David addressed the priest with the words Ha Khan, Ha Khan, Ha Roe, Ha Ta. You are the seer priest. Second, Second Samuel fifteen twenty seven. We're gonna get to, you know, what I'm saying we're gonna get into some great, uh, you know, Tanakh flow. You know, you can't search for the priest king without having a Tanakh flow. Um, the real, the reality is inside. You just have to open your eyes. So, we're not talking kind, <laughs> uh, you know, just to refer to, you know what I'm saying? Oh, okay, this kind must be, you know, the pros and the cons. You know what I mean? We're not talking kind. In terms of, oh, this this con must be a Canaanite, a Canaanite. Nah, man. Um, but this title was and is sought after by all nations. Well, even with the Zodiac priest, the Vulgate consequently regards Zodiac as a seer, although the interpretation is regarded by many scholars as incorrect. These two Difficult words are invent amended by Wal Halson Wal Halson to Ha Ka Cohen Ka Ha Rosh Ata you are chief priest. See to be a Ha Khan is to be a high priest. To have more ha is to have more wisdom, to have more air, more breath. And that's what we call higher mark ha khan. Higher mark. Because you got the fullness of the breath. Make sure you click the link below and subscribe to his new channel to get that drop. You know what I mean? Just, uh, yeah, man. Tune in and tune up, man. Because we just talking Press the John. See, there's many depictions of Press the John. Not just one where you. You know, start clicking at phenotypes. <coughs> I mean, does this depiction of Presser John look anything like this depiction? <coughs> yeah, thank y'all for the Tea recipes, man. It's done me well. I'm almost through. It's all good. Appreciate y'all for surfing the wave because we're just talking about Preston John. <laughs> King David. King David. Yeah, let's get into these cons. Since we know we're talking King David or Prester John, since we know they're all searching for Prester John, I mean, we got the Prester John studies. It's all going down. Let 
And we're going to get back into this letter here that we uh, left off at. Don't even trip, man. I'm just going to keep it flowing. And this is just what we're talking about when we talk Prester John study. This mysterious oriental priest came, right? This night. Let's go. We're talking priest came, Prester John. The temple are across the indigenous Hebrew towel. The mark, the sign, the covenant. Let's go. Oh, we're just talking Ethiopia. Get that drop, get, get 37, because we went in on the Ethiopians. And we're going to go in on Kush. We're going to go in on Ethiopia. The Kenites, all that stuff, man. Huh, did I skip? I'm just looking for the intro. Got the intro. Okay, okay, okay. Here we go. So let's get into the little bit of the forward, man. Wow. Wow, wow. There we go. So the aim of this book is to collate and present the major sources for the study of the legend of Prester John. This book is called Press the John the Legend and Sources. Click the links, get them at the library, click the links below. This is number 38, let go. For the medieval text, these are supplied in both the original language using Latin. We're going to get on this Latinus. We're going to get on the Latinus and English translations because they are less material. <coughs> To the usual discussion of Preston John, the modern texts are presented only in English. Most of these translations here are my own, too, have been reprinted with permission from the copyright holders. Although much of the material presented here has been known in the field of Preston John studies. Did you know that there are Preston John studies all over the world? So when you see Drive Nation digging on Preston John and having an, our own independent study and investigation, don't come try to shoot that down. There's Preston John studies all across the plane. There's a Preston John Institute in Rwanda. The Portuguese got the monument of the Preston John saying that they was looking for this man for 500 years. Urban Temp, Temp, Templar. Got some drop on the chronology. Digging on that as well. It's the year 1200, 1700. But let's go. Although much of the material presented here has been known in the field of Prester John studies. For some time, nearly all of it has only been available to those who have knowledge of the various foreign languages, including Latin, German, French, Portuguese. The primary aim has been to make this material accessible and to supplement the standard Preston John text with less well-known material. Especially from the early modern era, so we can better understand not only the legend's genesis and development, but also its later evolutions and slow demise. So we need to focus on the fact that there's already Preston John studies going on. Let's ch I'll check it. When you talk about Zarnik himself profited from his predecessors, he is generally considered to be the founder of the academic study of Preston John. So he's the one getting it into the institutions on the hush hush. Because you never heard about the academic studies of Preston John, you think this is, a, oh, we just talk about the last noble image of the Negro. How can you hijack that? Because it ain't talked to you, Naga. You digging on it on your own, Naga. This ain't popular studies. This ain't public school information. Shit, even at the library in the prison that they had me housed, we found some drop on Preston John and all the historians 
didn't know what was going on. Even the ones in Harvard. And when they found Preston John, even in the encyclopedia, they said, why didn't we know about this? Because maybe they weren't enlightened with the academic studies going on in their universities about Preston John. The last noble image of the Negro. We're going to get that. To the material presented here was brought to life through his thorough work and groundbreaking research. Okay, okay. All right, all right. I'm going to give you the President John letters. All right, man. Look, man. Look, man. The entire line of King Arthur. Right? But there were a, there was another relatively new school of British history headed by writers like John Fear of Monmouth, which created a false genealogy of kings through the line of King Arthur. Let's go. <laughs> At the end of the lengthy refutation of Joffrey and his New Amsterdam Arthurian history, Arthurian history. So they created a king Arthurian history. William William poses the following question: Is he dreaming of another world containing infinite kingdoms in which those things which he recounted earlier actually happen? This is a question that must also be asked of the Prester John legend, the figure of Prester John. Oh, they're hijacking him with the title Christian when they're going to the Nestorini. Nestori, Nestor, we're going to get into that. Priest and king who ruled over the marvelous Oriental Empire. That brings us into what? The so-called Mongols. Mongol means what? The great ones. So when I say Mongol, you think savage. But Mongol literally means the great ones. So instead of saying Mongols, if I say the great ones, will that connect back to the so-called Hebrew people? The great ones? The golden ones? The last noble image of the Negro who is ruling these oriental empire in the middle ages remember what the oriental looks like this is an oriental yes he is a mysterious oriental leader press the job alright man let's go man let's get to it man Let's get to it, man. I mean, it's, it's so much water, you know, much of how the tide battle for so much of this drop, man. Let's go, man. You know, let's go, man. There you go. Matter of fact, let's take it right here. Let's just get into it. We're about to get into some script. I'm going to do it like this first. You know, we, we're just, we, I'm just researching this Khan Cohen connection, right? Because we know Khan as either you're saying, yes, I agree with you in the most priestly vibration. Khan, they say Cohen as their Jewish priest. You see how they changed the Khan. To a coin, con, which most of the time they still spell with a K, which is why this little, you know, bozo here, whoever wrote this, man, <laughs> is putting the con and saying, well, maybe way back there's a connection, but in the Semitic alphabets, the spelling of the two words are basically off completely different roots, but we have a C O H E N, but he still puts the K. C or K. All right, so it's K. Remember, they're just dropping the vowels, K-H-N. Now we have Khan, K-H-A-N, and he says that, <laughs> that's H-A-N, that's completely different roots. How you put an H-A, when is the A, the vowel, not get dropped? Is this K-H-N the same thing here? K-H, drop the A, 
the N, just like they said the C or the K, drop the O, H, drop the E, N, just the consonants, right? Where's the consonants here? It's still K-H-N, but, you know, let's go, man. Khan is a popular surname among Pathan Muslims. Uh-huh. Everybody wants the Khan. We know that. You know, Genghis Khan stole the Khan, but has nothing in particular to do with the Mongols. Ah, huh? okay. For the German Khan, right? Remember, the Germans are still swarthy, according to Benjamin Franklin in 1751. So we're still talking about the so-called black man. Still the Khan in Germany. It is of Jewish or Hebrew origin and means priest in Hebrew. Right. Just like we just read about the Hakka. The high priest. I know it's small. Ha Cohen. This time the Cohen is spelled with a K. So Cohen is Khan, which is still what they're using to signify. Their high priest, their priest, Khan, Khan. So when they took the American, right? When they took the copper colored braces, 1828 American. And they were taking the Khan. They were still taking the Khan, which is the Khan, which is the Khan. K H A K A H A H N. What else we got? K O H N. All Khan. All the way back to the C O H E N is why they try to hide the Khan. All right, all right, all right, all right. Ka, Ka, the priesthood. When they took the title, right, a native of America, the priest already here on this land, the priest of Hawa, our creator, already here, which are the who? Copper colored races, who they're calling Negro today. Found here by the Europeans. You just found us here, didn't bring us here, these copper colored Nagas. We're just found here. Remember, this is in 1828. Before they changed this definition, you look at all the definitions after 1828, they ain't going to say this. I mean, if it was nothing, oh, yeah, no, no, that's just the current, you know, Tonto Native American. Yeah, then why did they even change it then? You know, why would they need to change it if this was just talking about the proxy? But they knew what copper color is. What ruddy is found here by the Europeans. We're just talking the cons that were already found here, man. We're just talking about the cons, man. We're just talking about Preston John, King David, Preston John, King David, Preston John. Copper color. Cons. Columbus is looking for the Grand Khan, right? Let's put it all together. So we're going to get some more out of this, uh, you know, legend sources. All this great drop here, man. We're going to get some more of that. Hold on, man. Let me get... I think I'm going to get a little fluty, man. If y'all don't mind, man. I think I'm going to hit up the drop library. And get a little fluty. If you don't mind. Because I'm going to enjoy this man. We're going to break it all the way down. I think I might do like four press of Johns in a row. Just to catch us up to speed man. I think I owe y'all that man. Let's go man. Let's go. Let's get fluty. Let's get fluty. Alright man. We're going to get these flutes going. We're going to go into... Just some great script, man. Hold on, man. I think I got some. Where's that? Okay, there we go. Let's go into some script. You know, I just want to read up on some things. Right before I even go there. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's do it right. 
Right, yeah. Here's my drop chat, man. Oh, yeah, we got some drop. Oh, yeah, Ty Battle drop some more drop. Uh, some major drop. We're going to get out this book called The Realm of Preston John. Oh, yeah, we got some cold jams. You can compare this jam right here, man. This uh, Nat King Cole in 432 and 440. Just compare it. See how you flowing. Check this out, man. Here we go. Oh. That's the other joint. Hold up. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. We got it. Let's get food. Let's talk David. Let's just talk David. Go get that drop out the drop chatter, man. King David from the Icon. They broke that link, but this is from a book called the icons the russian icon and in russia in the catacombs you see these you know true to life depictions man this is a depiction right here of king david and we don't have to stretch it by finding another depiction of king david Let's talk about David. We got plenty of time. This is our investigation. We take our time around here. We're getting fluty. Let's go. Is David to rule again? Because, you know, why does Hosea 3 and 5 say, Seek our creator. We will return. Seek our creator. What does it say? Let's get the whole thing. Then I, then said the, then said Hawa, your power unto me. Go yet, love a woman, beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, right? Just like Israel has become an adulteress, adulterers. We put another power before our power. According to the love of Hawa towards the children of Israel who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. So I brought her to me. So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver. Hawa said, fine. You want to play the harlot? I'll buy you. And for a homer of barley and a half homer of barley. And I said unto her, thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot. So I bought you. You was playing the harlot. You was playing the whore. But now I bought you. You, you ain't going to be no hoe no more. You ain't going to be no hoe no more. You shall abide for me. Just for me. You'll live just for me. Says Hawa to you, the children. Thou shalt not play the harlot, man. Stop being a hoe, man. You being a hoe around here. And thou shalt not be for another man. 
so will I also be for you. You see, this is a very intimate relation we have with our breath of security. You are mine and I am yours. And this covenant I make with you and you alone. What does it say in Amos 3? For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king. Without a prince. Sacrifice. There ain't going to be no sacrifices. You in captivity, man. You have no image. You have no noble image. And without an effort. And without terrifying. So all your noble, all your royal, all your priestly things are gone, my naga. And then what? Afterwards shall the children of Israel return. All right, we're being prophetic. We're returning again. Then what do we do? Hawa. And seek your creator. Seek Hawa. They're not God, but their power. When you seek your creator, you're seeking your power. Hawa. So when you seek your Hawa, you seek your creator, what else do you seek? And David, their king. This is prophetic. This is Hosea. We just read. Straight out of Ezekiel 34, and we'll get Ezekiel 37. We just want to solidify that everything we're doing is Tanakh based. We're looking at our prophets, we're looking at prophecy, we're putting the chronology, the timelines together. We're saying, yo, this is all popping what appears between 11, 1200s up to 1500s, man. Could be even more recent. The book of Daniel could have been written in the 1800s or the 1600s. David could have been rocking in the 1200s. Joshua could have been rocking in the 1000s to 1100s. All this could just be happening recent without the BC. So there's something magical when you start to seek in this investigation. At least when you put all that together, that's what makes our investigation very important. Because we're putting it with the chronology, the true chronology of Anatoly Fortemanko. And you can get dozens of his books, Love to Tide Battle, in the Drive Library right now. Who's, you know, using this, uh, you know, method to put together the Byzantine history, the Egyptian history, different things like that. We did many videos on it. Just research, uh, you know, the drive, 4 through 2, the drive, chronology, all that, man. You'll get a lot of recon already. So after you got knocked out and you're waking up and you're returning, you seek your creator and David, your king. And you shall fear or you shall respect, obey your creator and his goodness in the latter day. Latter days, man, future, man, David, your king, reigning in the future. We read 34, Ezekiel. What does it say in Ezekiel 37? And then I'm going to get into this link. Oh, yes, the Valley of the Dry Bones, right? Make sure you get all that. Let's get it from here. So after these bones come back to life, these people come back on board. They return, right? Israel returns. They seek their creator. And David is all we're doing in the Preston John investigation is seeking David throughout the timelines. Readjusting the timelines. 
looking at it with a dragonfly's perspective that's a full 360 degrees if you don't know to see clearly so this house gets put back together again moreover thou son of man take the one stick that's funny right Ezekiel is also called the son of man right just like they're doing in the new text Take you one stick and write upon it for Judah, for the children of Israel, his companions. Take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. 17. And join them to one another into one stick, and they shall become one in your hand. And when the children speak unto thee, saying, Will you show us what you mean by this man? 19, he's saying to them, Hawa, thus says Hawa, behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one. So the entire love story of the entire Tanakh is for Israel and the Creator to be one again. Which separates it from the whole, you know what I'm saying, plot of the New Test, right? Because it's not for the children of Israel to return to the Creator. Now it's for everyone through the blood of Jesus. Oh, Jesus is at the right hand. Nah, you're at the right hand. David, his covenant lasts forever. So who's being replaced in the New Test? Let's go. So these sticks come together. The tribes come together. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king. One king. And this prophecy. When the valley of the dry bones. They all come back to life. They got the energy. The Ruach. They all come together. They become one nation in the land upon the mounds of Israel. Has this happened yet? I don't think so. Where all the tribes came back together and became one nation. And had one king. One king shall be king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore at all. Neither shall they defile themselves. This is Ezekiel. He's writing in the time of Babylonian captivity, man. After the last king of Judah was carried off. This is way after David and Samuel and all that. First Samuel's the first king. So we're talking Ezekiel in the time of the Babylonian exilarchs. Let's put it together. So they should become one nation. Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor their detestable things, nor any of their transgressions. So when we're digging on Wang Khan and the priest kings and different ones, and some are having hijacked detestable things connected with their name, and others have this priestly status connected with their name. Then we're bringing it all into picture because not all priest kings were perfect in the eyes of the creator. Not all Prester Johns were perfect. Some did detestable things. Some had transgressions. But let's go. Didn't David do detestable things? Didn't David have transgressions? Didn't Solomon do detestable things? But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people and I will be their God. And who? And David. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. 
So this is after you come back together, become one nation, wake up out the valley of the dry bones. This is after Babylonian captivity, right when it's popping off. And my servant David shall be king in the future. And they shall all have one shepherd. And they shall also walk in my judgments, observe my statutes, and do them. Let's go. So this is an interesting, um, where is it at? Flow right here. You know, we dodged the hijack, get the babies out, but this is also bringing up some more script, man. Talking about, you know, King David ruling again. And that's what this particular 38 is about, man. I wanna I wanna bring it, I wanna go right back home. And then we're gonna, you know, then we're gonna go in. But let's 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 wrap a couple things up and let's go in. Let's go. Allow one. Get flu. Wow. We take our time in this investigation. It belongs to Drop Nation. You have your own Preston John study. Just because other folks ain't having fun in their studies, they want to poke their nose in your study. Well, this belongs to you. One Drop Nation. The drop is the water. The drop is the healing dew, the purified substance, the alchemy. So let's go. Scriptures speak about King David coming again and rule Israel in the last days. So I'm not over here just reading Ezekiel 37 where it's saying after they wake up out the valley of dry bones, Take these two sticks, put them together. This is the future, right? This is my, my team coming back together. And they're going to have one king. My servant David shall be king over them. And they shall all walk. They shall all have one shepherd. <laughs> Scriptures speak about King David coming again and rule Israel in the last day. Jeremiah 30, verse 9. But they shall serve Hawah, their creator, and David, their king, whom I raise up for them. So Jeremiah, the prophet, is speaking about David in the future. Right? I mean, this is what? Isaiah, Jeremiah. This is after Samuel, right? After the you know, they had the judges, and then Israel asked for a king. Hiram breaks it down beautifully because they're asking for a whole nother frequency. Because David never called himself king. They were priests. Khan is priest. So David, their king or their Khan or their Wong Khan or Ong Khan or Ong Khan will I raise up for them we just read Ezekiel 37 David my servant shall be king over them they will have one shepherd Hosea 3 and 5 afterward the children of Israel shall return and seek Hawah and David their king they shall fear or Obey the creator in his goodness in the latter days. So we're talking about Jacob's trouble, which we know is happening today. Jeremiah 33 through 10. For behold, the days are coming, says the while that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah. And I will cause them to return in the land and I gave I gave their fathers, and they shall possess it at last, for the day is great. 
so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. But they shall serve Hawah, their creator, and David, their king, who I will raise up. I'll save you from afar. All right. Now, breaking down this Hosea 3 and 5, this is interesting here. It says, God also spoke through prophet Hosea regarding David's return in the latter days. However, the time of David's return comes with a different description. Israel shall be without a king or prince. This means there would not be any ruler for the children of Israel, which implies Israel will not be an independent nation. They will be slaves. My naga. Without sacrifice, this means there would not be any temple to make a sacrifice since the Jews or the Hebrews cannot make sacrifices anywhere they like. Without sacred pillars, this means the children of Israel will not be able to will not be able to continue in their abominations of idol worship using sacred pillars. Without effort, this means there would be no there will not be any priests. Since only priests are allowed to put put effort, put on the effort, man. So dig on it. I will establish one shepherd over them. Ezekiel thirty four, Micah five and two. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. Whose going forth are from old, of old, from everlasting. Therefore he shall give them up until the time that she is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of the, his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of Hawah and the majesty of the name of Hawah, his power, his creator. And they shall abide for now. He shall be great to the ends of the earth. We keep hearing about the ends of the earth. And to them, when they write ends of the earth, all the Ethiopians are in the ends of the earth. They're talking about right here in America, in the islands. Behold, the days are coming. Jeremiah 23, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Translation, translation, right? You know what I mean? Oh, David, is that Jesus Christ? Do you see the hijack? And Matthew, oh, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the dreadful return. Oh, yeah, man, we're going to get into John the Baptist, right? Who's pressed to John? <laughs> we know that there Jesus is Joshua. So is there a Joshua and David phantom duplicate connection as well? We're just talking about Preston John, the last noble image, the last noble image of the Negro. All right. All right. Let's go. Oh, we're going to get back into this Hiberian War map. I told you I'll pull it out, man, because we're going to talk Kush. But when we talk Kush, remember this is Africa. This is a reality simulation in Arizona. All right, I get it. It's, it. it's a gamer map. It doesn't have much drop, right? Right? It's, it's for gamers. This is a depiction of the world at a time when things are connected. This is Africa here. You look and you won't really find a lot of familiar names. But when you scroll this way over South America, right? These is Amazon, Amazonia. 
right on top of South America. It seems to be land masses connected, and one is Zimbabwe. Oh, I thought that was in Africa. It's on top of South America. In this reality simulation, reality simulation. You have Iranistan or Persia also connected to South America. So we're reading about Persia. Is there a South American indigenous connection with Persia? Here you have the Thoth spell barrier, man. The Thoth Amman spell barrier, right? Where Persia broke off at the tip of South America is the Thoth Amman spell barrier. It's just a game. It's just a game. On top of South America here, you have Kush. K-U-S-H. Kush. Kush connected to the Pacific or Western Ocean or Kush's Sea. How does Kush, remember the capital of Kush is Moreau, right? You have Moreau here. Next to that is the Timbuktu or Timbuktu, they call it. Timbuktu. You have Darfur. You have Stasia. Stasia has Kemet in it. Kemet. <coughs> Let's go. You also have Luxor and Sukhmet and the Haunted Pyramid. So you have this Egypt situation happening here. Right on top of South America. Right over Kush. Kush and Egypt are connected here. But on top of that is Shem. S-H-E-M. Shem. Alright. You keep going up. You got Ophir. You got... You know, all the way up to pick land. And that's divided into 12 portions right here in California, it would seem, right? Right around where, where Cali would be, basically. All that. And you got, I guess, part of Canada here. You have the frozen lands, all right? And right about where the four corners are, you got Samaria, northern, southern clan, right here. Northern and Southern tribes, right? Heartland. So it's a lot of drop going down. And a lot of what you would think would be the Egyptian drop. is popping off right over here. And Kush is right here on top of South America. On top of the what? Black kingdoms. Black kingdoms. We're talking about the Black Horde, right? The Order. The Black River. The Amazon River. Cali, right? Kush, Kali is black. Kara is black. Kara Katai, Kara Cathay. Why was uh, Columbus looking for Cathay, knowing where Cathay is? We're just talking about reality simulations. Man. Just right here, man, in the uh, drop, 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 chatter, chat, 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 chat. What else we got here, man? What else we got? Man? Oh, yeah. We got some Moses drive. Oh, yeah, we're going to get some of this connecting the Akhenaten. All right, all right, all right. I'm just, you know, I'm just surfing the waves, seeing, seeing, what, seeing what we're talking about. I'm going to get back to that. I'm going to get back to that. What's this going on? Some, some Exodus drop. Evidence of Exodus from Egypt. All right. Yep, yep. Okay, okay. Got some Red Sea drop. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I was digging on this Adi Khan. Because we about to get back in the, uh... We about to get back in the book of Jashir. And we're talking about the Pharaoh Adi Khan. Being one of the Pharaohs, you know, during these tribulations, you know, with Moses and the Red Sea and all that, man. Hold up, man. Come on, man. No hijacks, man. So we're going to get back into Adi Khan. All right, good, because we just talked about Moses being the king of Kush. All, right, all that makes sense. All that makes sense, man. 
And Ty Battle dropped some great drop. Before we get back into Ty Battle's other drop, man. Uh, uh, Legend and Sources, man. So Aqua Ty, A High, A High for bringing us to the tribe. We're just digging on a few things. We talked about some of the Kenites, the Rechabites last time. We're going to go back in that throughout this series a lot. We're going to really dig on Rechab, Ken, uh, the Ken, the tribes of Ken, Ken, Ka, Ken, Kane. Some are connecting them to the tribes of Cain and Tubal Cain. So, you know, were, were all these Canaanites cursed? When Cain was cursed, right, in Genesis 4. Mm-hmm. Adam knew his knew Eve, his wife, she can see Bear Cain. All right. Cause I got a man. All right, okay. I have gotten a man from Hawa. So Cain was a tiller of the ground, Abel the keeper of the sheep. All right. So Cain brought fruit. I mean brought a fruit of the ground, of the fruit of the ground and offering unto Hawa. So he brought Hawa of the fruit of the ground. I just want to just look at it with with uh, new eyes here. Abel brought the firstlings of the flock of the fat. Okay. Cain's offering said he didn't respect it. That's what it's saying. He didn't expect the, respect the fruit. He wanted the fat, they say, right? Remember Max Spears said all this is in reverse. This is for Max Spears, you know what I mean? You can dig on that. We dropped it on the uh, radio. We, we did a whole drop on it, but, you know, look up Max Spears, you know, see what he says about Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. He says, Cain... That Abel really slew Cain. But, you know, it was, you know, I don't know. I wasn't there. I'm just saying with how they be flipping things. And Abel was Abel, or Baal was Abel. I mean, he was breaking it down. But let's just look at it, you know, through these these eyes here, man. Let's see, man. Um, so Cain killed Abel, according to this uh, flow here. I'm my brother's keeper, all right. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood. When you till the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shall thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto Hawa, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy fa face shall I be hid. <coughs> And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And Hawa said, Therefore, whoever slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And Hawa set a mark upon Cain lest any find him should kill him. So was the mark as a ridicule. That's how people, you know, bring it up. When they're just talking about, oh, you got the mark. You got the mark. Is that a ridicule thing? Or is there a mark or some type of energy around Cain that saves him from being slain? So when we get into the Kenites and their connection to Cain, you know, could we be talking about a tribe of the Kenites that's connected through Reuel or Jethro, who they're called Midianites, but they are actually Canaanites or Kanites or, you know, because you got Canaan, Canaan. Canaan was the cursed seed of Ham, according to that, you know, story there, right? So Canaan was the cursed seed of Ham. Now you got Cain over here, who's also cursed personally. Did it say all your seed would be this and all your seed would be that? You know, it says you would be a vagabond and a, a vagabond in the earth. But he said, everybody that sees me is going is to slay me. 
And the Mosai put a mark and said, man, anybody that touch you, man, they gonna get it seven times over. So this is just showing that the creator was still, you know, giving love to Cain for some reason, right? He didn't let no one just slay him. And he put a mark of protection. So any, less any find him should kill him. So it was something, some type of mark that was keeping Cain safe. So when we get into the Kenites, we can connect why they were within the flock of Judah. And Moses married, what they say, married a Kenite wife. Or, you know, could they be referring to as a poor the, the Medianite? Possibly as the same thing. So <clears throat> I'm just, you know, we just going, man. Follow me now. Now, this is a tie battles drop. This is not in order. But this is just some uh, pages out of the realm of Preston John by, I believe, Silverberg. I believe is his name. And I don't know if I can get that any bigger, man. If you can see it a little bit, let me see. Might be a little small, so you know, pull it up in the uh, drop chat. Now here it says the conflict between lion and the unicorn, which cannot be traced to any source earlier than Prester John's letter, took on a symbolic political significance in the late 16th century during the time of tension between England and Scotland. For the royal arms of England bore these three, bore three lions and those of Scotland bore a pair of unicorns. Thus Spencer and his fiery queen writes like a lion whose imperial power a proud rebellious unicorn defies. When King James the Sixth of Scotland, we just got back in that history of the United States by J.C. Ripad, talking about King James, 1603, putting the patents down to colonize you and me through the London Company. We're going to get back in that drop. Ty Battle also hit us with some great uh, links into the Hudson Bay and different things, man, going down. So when King James VI of Scotland came to reign also as James I of England in 1603, he brought one of Scotland's unicorns with him. Is this a real unicorn? Is this code word for dragon? Are they calling, instead of saying he brought one of his dragons, are they saying unicorn? Which one do you believe? Let's go. The shield in England's royal arms then was supported on one side by a lion, on the other side by the red dragon of Wales. Oh, you thought I was just pulling dragon out of my ass? No, we see it on all these flags of oh, this dragon that they need to slay, right? So you have hijack slayers, which are the dragons, and you got dragon slayers, which are everyone who's outside of that frequency. They need to slay the dragon, right? The hijack always needs to slay the dragon. Just pay attention. The shield in England's royal arms then was supported by the lion and the red dragon on the other side. James replaced the dragon with the unicorn. And there the unicorn has remained. So it was originally a dragon, but got replaced by a unicorn by King James. Ain't that something? 1607, the history of the four-footed beast, the naturalist Edward Topsell solemnly retold the tale of how lions trap unicorns by causing them to embed embedded their horns in the trunks of trees using words not too different from those given above and said these things are reported by the king of Ethiopia. Let's talk Ethiopia. Which one? In a Hebrew epistle unto the Bishop of Rome, one must be familiar with the letter of Prester John and its various medieval mutations to realize that what Topsail means is the king of India. 
which one those are both vague terms right to discover to uh you know discuss a a vast land of so-called dark-skinned people so-called nagas in the latin epistle in the emperor of the Byzantine. Let's go. Cause we're just talking about the great Khan. I know it's a small, I know it's small, so pull it up. We're talking to Tartars, right? The Afrasay King John died without, hold on, I think I got the one right before this. One away. There we go. This is one away. Let's start here, man. So at the same time, when the Frenchmen took Antioch, a certain man named Khan 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 had dominion over the northern regions lying there. About Khan is a proper name. We just went into the Khans. Allahuwa. <coughs> I mean, this is a book called The Realm of Presser John. We don't even have a PDF on this yet. You just getting the drop drop. Aqua Tai got the drop. It's an ongoing investigation, man. We're talking about the Byzantine Empire, the history, the 1400s, 1312. So Khan Khan had dominion over the northern regions lying there about. Khan is a proper name. Khan is the name of an authority or dignity which which sapphieth, signifieth a diviner or soothsayer. So Khan is a high priest, a diviner, a proper name, an authority is Khan. See how they spell it? Even if it's small, you can see they spell it C-A-N. What does it say here? C-A-N. So the Amaru Khans, the priest that we just found here by the Europeans in a whole new world to them, are the copper color cons that were just found here? You are the Khan dynasty. And the whole world has made a confederacy against you to steal your Khan. Who is Preston John? Who is Dawu? Khan Khan. Th authority, dignity, signifies as a diviner. All diviners are called Khan among them. Hmm. You want to talk cool, cool, Khan? You want to talk, it's a call to. You're just talking priest, King. Whereupon their princes are called Khans. You're just talking the princes, the Indian princes, princes. Because that unto them belong the government of the people by divination, high priest. We do read also in history of Antioch that the Turks sent for aid against the Frenchmen unto the kingdom of Khan Khan. For out of those parts the whole nation of the Turks first came. Mm. The said Khan was of the nation of Karakatai. Well, Wong Khan, Prester John, 
was the emperor of the tribe, the Kara Katai. Kara just means black. Kara signifies black. Kara signifies black. Kara means black. We're talking black people, right? And Katai is the name of their country or Cathay or Cathness. We're talking Cathness, man. Cathness. We're talking the Khan. Man. We, we, we pull it all out for President John. So we know who we are and we know who we're not. When we talk Andrews, they are first found in Cathness, the family associated with Clan Ross. What does Cathness have to do with Cathay and the Katai? C A I T Katai Katniss. We're talking the Hebrew Tau, right? The last letter of the Hebrew. So when you see a cross next to Preston John, it might be in reference to the Hebrew letter Tau. The mark, the sign, the covenant. We're just talking you, Naga. We're just talking the lost tribes of Israel. We're just talking the Rus, like the Russians, like the Russians, like the Russian artwork. The icons, the Rus, the Russian. This is a Russian piece of art. A Russian piece of art found in Cathay, Cathness. We're just getting a drop, baby, man. Come on. Come on. We could do it. So that Karakate signifies the black Cathay. This name was given to make a difference between the four safe people and the people of Cathay inhabiting eastward over the ocean sea. These Cathayans dwelt, dwelt upon certain Alps by which I traveled and in certain plain country. Within those Alps, there inhabited a Nestorian shepherd, Nestoroni. Remember, in etymology, it only means old king renowned for wisdom. Old king renowned for wise counsel. So you're going to see this Nestor keep popping up. In reference to specifically what was going on with Preston John. And we got so many great sources we've been digging on. It's all making sense, man. It's all starting to make sense. When we're talking Preston John, he keeps saying an historian. He was an historian. A certain type of Christian, right? An historian. Old king renowned for wise counsel. John the Elder, right? John the Baptist, right? King, priest, reigning in the Far East, huh? And this is where it's going to keep coming back to this yellow dashi, which is where we're going to be turning. We're talking about the same Kara Cathay or Kara Katai. It says phonetically, change phonetically. In Hebrew to Yahana, in Syriac Yuhana, talking Gorkan, is Yahanan, is Yahanes, 
is John. Who is Preston John? We know that Mongo only means great one. And we're talking about a King David of India going down in 1221. Who's this King David? Well, like we learned before, Genghis Khan took the title David after defeating Preston John Wong Kong in the war in 1203, 1202. Oh man, we're gonna get some more of that because we're only talking about Ethiopia. Which one? We're only talking about Preston John, the realm of Preston John, the three Indias, the three Indies. Land of riches, marvels, peace, justice, administered by a court of archbishops, priors, and kings. Take their kingdoms, the dukedoms, the principalities. Let's keep going. As you see, I'm truly surfing the way. Oh, we got some antiquities of the Jews dropped, man. Let's just get this right quick. So we got Ruby Queets, the Franciscan. Pull up the links. This is a wiki source, Curious Myths of the Middle Ages, Press the John. So Ruby Queets, the Franciscan. Who in 1253 was sent on a mission into Tartary. Was the first to let in a little light of the, on the fable he writes. The Katai, right? Kathness, Katai, Kathy, Catherine. The Cathay, Katai, dwelt beyond certain mountains across which I wandered. And in a plain in the midst of the mountains lived once an important historian. See how they keep having to put that when they talk about Wong Kong, Preston John. You got to say Nestor, old king renowned for wise counsel. They keep making him one of the Magi in the New Test. He was one of the Ethiopian eunuchs. One of the Magi, one of the three Magi witnessing baby Jesus. Oh, you mean baby Joshua. Hawashua. Hmm. Which one? Are we talking the 1100s? And would it all come to light? So he's an Astorian shepherd. I'll place my shepherd. There will be one shepherd over you, Israel. Who ruled over the Nestorian people called Naaman. So he was said to have been killed in friendly fire by the Naamans. But no one witnessed it. So when Gore Khan died, the Nestorian people raised this man to be king and called him King Johannes. And related of him ten times as much as the truth. The Nestorian thereabouts have this way with them that about nothing they made a great fuss and thus they got have got it noised abroad that Sartak, Mangu Khan and Ken Khan so we're going to talk about the Kens and the Kenites remember this Ken Khan and they say that they were Christians but let's go Simply because they treated Christians well. Wait, back it up. You're saying the Nestorians, right? The Nestorians have this way about them, all right? And thus, we have this way about them. That about nothing they make a great fuss, and thus they have got it noise abroad that Sartak, Mongol Khan, King Khan were Christians simply because they treated Christians well. So you're saying these people, these these Christians will call the Mongols Christians and they will call the Hebrews Christians just because they treat Christians nicely? 
Because at that time, they're at war against Islam, right? They're at war against the Sultan for the Holy Land. More on more. And showed them honor, more honor than other people. So because you treated these Christians, you didn't slay them right away. You showed them a little more honor than other people. They called you a Christian too. Now read it right here. What does it say? Yet in fact, they were not Christians at all. So every time we keep hearing about these Nestorian Christians, the fact that they're being called Nestorian, or the fact that they're being related to an old king renowned for wise counsel, renowned for wisdom, the fact that these Nestorians were only called Christians because they treated Christians well and showed them more honor than other people, yet in fact, they were not Christians at all. Which is why they're searching for Prester John. They didn't, they're not like, oh, we have a Christian brother out here. No, they're searching for the gold. They want to hijack the Hebrew, Naga, copper color, woolly haired Naga, priest king. They want to hijack Preston John, because remember, did a black man discover the fountain of youth? We're going to read this article again, too. This is a great article. Read it. Dig on it. We've got nothing but sources from Drive Nation letting you know that these Mongols and this King John were not Christians at all just because they're called Nestorians. And in like manner, the story got out, got about that there was a great King John. However, I traversed these pastors and no one knew anything about him except a few Nestorians. They only had to drop on King David. In his pasture lives King Khan. So when we talk about Moses and the mixed multitude and did Moses marry a Kenite? <coughs> oh man, almost there. When we talk about Ken Kong and the Kenites and the relationship with the Cain, children of Cain, but were they a blessed seed? Were they a blessed seed from this Cain? That was rocking as Midianites, rocking with the pastors of Judah, because in his pastors lives the Ken, the priestly Ken. At whose court was Brother Andrew, who I met on the way back. This Johannes had a brother, a famous shepherd named Ong, who lived for, who lived for three weeks' journey beyond the mountains of Carcates. The Ong Khan was a real individual. He wasn't fake. This is a real individual. He lost his life in the year 1203. Didn't I tell you Genghis Khan wrote up on Ong Khan, Wong Khan? So let's put it together because here you have this King John who then also has a brother who is Ong Khan. So it's a Davidic family that's already ruling as Khan before 1203 when who? Genghis Khan stole the Khan. Here they call him Zangis Khan. Marco Polo, the Venetian traveler, identifies all Khan with Prester John. We're not just pulling Prester John. You know what I mean? Just nowhere out to eat. That this is. Documented even by Mar Marco Polo. This is documented by Rubric the Frisky and Otto, Otto the Otto of Friesling. I will now tell you of the deeds of the Tartars, how they gained the mastery and spread over the whole earth. The Tartars dwelt between Georgia and Barjou. <coughs> 
where there is a vast plain and level country on which are neither sites nor forts, but capital pas pasturage and water. They had no chief of their own, but paid to press the John tribute. Listen to how this gang is con connects, because some people are confused. We're just investigating the priest king. And this is also backed up in the book Preston John Legend and the Sources, dropped on us by Aqua Thai Battle and the Battle Family. That Genghis Khan is coming from a land called Moal, who's over there just being jealous and angry at Priest King Preston John. They had no chief of their own, these Tartars or these tribes of Genghis. But paid to Preston John tribute. They were paying him tribute first. Of the greatness of the Preston John. Who was properly called Ong Khan. Or Wang Khan. The whole world spoke. Of the greatness of the priest king. The whole world spoke of it. The whole world spoke. The whole earth. The Tartars dwelt between Georgia and Barju. And Barju, the greatest oppressor John, whole world spoke. The Tartars gave him one of every ten head of cattle. When Preston John noticed that they were increasing, he feared them and planned how he could injure them. All right, so this is from a hijack perspective. He got afraid of them. Let me see how I can hurt them. You think that's how it went down? Well, let's go. He determined, therefore, to scatter them, and he sent barons to do this. But the Tartars guessed what Preston John proposed, and they went away in the wide waste of the north, where they might be beyond his reach. Then he goes out to relate how Zangus, Jangus, or Genghis Khan became the head of the Tartars. So when you talk the Tartars and Tartary, you're talking the anti-King David, the anti-Preston John. Hey, remember we got that depiction that that dark or rich copper colored brother skinny brother in the in the painting and how he fought against Preston John right so Genghis Khan fought against Preston John and after a desperate fight overcame and slew him all right there's different different takes on this you can keep it going you can keep it going Go. So read this drop, man. Aqua Tide dropped in here. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's connecting so much, man. I, I wish I had more time to dig on more of it, man. It definitely goes back into the Yulu Tashis. Like I said, we're going to start turning the corner. We talked Kan Kan, the Karakatai. Yulutashi. Ah, oh, man. I know so much drop, man. All right, all right, all right. All right, Aquata, you got the drop. Wong Kong, Tagru, the carriers. Voot or Ong Kong, C A N. He tells the Tagru's downfall at the hands of Genghis Khan. So you can't be against Preston John and Genghis Khan. Because they were at war. You're going to have to choose up. You're going to have to choose up. I'm just, I'm just digging on it, man. Just digging on it, man. Just digging on it. Down here it says, An historian naming who was said to be descended from the three magi of the gospel. Right, right. Right, right. Okay, 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 okay. Here's a, you know, you can see right here, The Realm of Preston John by Robert Silverberg. Oh, uh, no, I know. 
I know I caught time. I know I got a lot of drive, man. But as you can see, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to bring it all into reality again. That these maps exist. That will have the correct orientation. That you are not in the west in America. You are in the east. You are in the Pacific, right? That's why they put Pacific on both sides. Like the, it's going to curve into a ball. Connect the Pacific Oceans. <clears throat> the oceans only on one side. The Pacific. So when you're over here. South America is really North America when you got the correct orientation. You see how this almost connects to Antarctica. We're going to go back in that Preston John drive about the Shambhala. Antarctica connection with Shambhala, which is connected to Cibola. All of this is connected. All of this is connected. So get your orientation, man. Get your orientation. Let's go. Let go, man. We got got. So much to belly flop into, man. Guess it's time to talk Kush. Because when we talk record bites, we talk Midianites, we talk Canites. How does this really connect? What we do have to remember is that we we're reading in the book of Jasher. Chapter 73. Make sure you can see it all here. Hold up. And I uh, probably can't see it all, all but I'm trying. <clears throat> in the 50 fifth year of the reign of the pharaoh king of egypt that is in the 157th year of the israelites going down into egypt reigned moses and cush huh so you're saying moshe is king of cush let's keep reading moses was 27 years old when he began to reign over cush and 40 years did he reign. So we got some of this before. Moshe reigning in Cush for 40 years. The king of Cush. Hawa granted Moses favor and grace in the eyes of all the children of Cush. And the children of Cush loved him exceedingly. So Moses was favored by Hawa and by men. And in the 70s. 17th or 7th excuse me day of his reign all the children of Cush assembled and came before Moses and bowed down to him to the ground which connects to a lot of great work that Hakai hired Mars putting together man we had a great great powwow on this one man and you know brothers you know he he got that breath man because we was fighting on the same side sometimes right I mean, Moses was king of Cush, and Hawaii was rocking with Moses and Cush during this time. So when we mention Cush, hold on, man. Where is it, man? Where is it, man? <laughs> when we mention Cush, when we have orientation, and we put Cush back in what could be its original place, K-U-S-H, and you have the Cushes Sea, the Western Sea, right? This is Cush. We see how all this could be connected. Let's go. And all the children spoke together in the presence of the king. Saying, give us counsel that we may see what is to be done. So they went to counsel for Moshe as the children of Cush assembled and came before Moses. See, when I get, when I given this drop in the KJV. <laughs> and these new translations of things. But it's the book of Yasha, man.
So you read all this, man. This has to do with the wars that were being fought. So all the children of Cush each went each to his home, to his wife and children, and all belonged to him. And Balaam the magician, when he saw the city was taken, he opened the gate. He and his two sons and eight brothers fled and returned to Egypt to the Pharaoh of Egypt. They are sorcerers and magicians who are mentioned in the book of the law, standing against Moses when Hawa brought the plagues into Egypt. So Moses took the city by his wisdom, and the children of Cush placed him on the throne instead of Kikianus, king of Cush. Moses was placed on the Cush throne, Cushite throne. Hmm. They gave him a Cushite queen, but then we read that, you know, the servant Eleazar had already, you know, laid it out. Thou shalt not make a woman from the daughters of Canaan. Now then we end up hearing that he marries a a Kenite wife, but she's not from Canaan. The Kenites are not the Canaanites. The Kenites are possibly from Cain, but not Canaan. <laughs> well, let's go. Also, what Isaac did tell, did when Jacob had fled from his brother, when he commanded, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan, nor make an alliance with any of the children of Ham. So if he did make an alliance with the Canaanites or Rechabites who are possibly of Cain are they the children of Ham? No, they would be Cain. Ham came later, right? After Noah and all that, right? So we just, you know, we're searching through this Cain, Canaan, Canaanite. I mean, let's go, man. Remember the record, bite. Remember the record, bites. I told you we ain't going to leave the record, bites this time because the record, bites are connecting this Preston John investigation, this nomadic tribe, this Moshe. These are Levites of the tribe of Moses and the priesthood. The tribes of Yannis, right? Yannis. The whole nation of them implies an exalted religiosity. Isn't presbytery a likely notion to have emerged out of the legend of the tribe of Levites? This could be a direct forebearer of Prester John. We're just talking about the tribes of Moses. Indeed, they were too exalted for possession of territory in biblical times. So you have a separate tribe of Moses. That's not the Levites. That are a mixed multitude. And yes, the origin of Abyssinia. Absolutely is mixed. Because when you have Judah. When you have Judah. Mixing. With these Kenites. Hold up man. Old name for Ethiopia, right? Abyssinia, Habasa, Habasa, mixed, right? Habash, mixture. I'm just looking at it from, from a perspective of having the tribe of Judah mixed with Jethro's tribe or Reuel or the Kenites or the Rechabites. Reuel, Rechab, Reuel, Rechab, Reuel. Who are the Rechabites? Got to remember the record box. 
The Bible refers to a family of them called Rechabites. Rechab, father of Jahanadab, belonged to the Kenites and were connected with Israel through Moses' marriage. Thus, Heber and Jael. Heber the Kenite, right? And Israel entered Canaan and shared their inheritance. Because these Canes or Kenites or this Ken Khan, right? We got the Kenites here. We were just reading about the Ken Khan. Where was that at? The con con. Where's that king con? Where's that king con? So the three indies drop. All right, there we go. In his pastures lives the king con, right? So this same historian, these historian people, and they were not Christians at all, just to clear it up. But anybody that they treated good. They treated them well, so they called them Christians simply because they treated Christians well. Treated Christians well. But in these pastors, in the pastors of what, you know, could be Judah here, is the Ken Khan. And how is this Ken related? How is this Ken related? Let's go right here, man. Where's my jash? Where's my jash? All right, so when we're dealing with this Kush, we're talking about this marriage with Zipporah. Let's keep going. And we read all this, man, so, you know, go get the drop. Hold on right quick. Let me go to that rack of bites. Because I want to finish this point with these Ken Knights. Since we got the Ken Khan. Alright, the Bible refers to this family of men called Rechabites or Rechab, father of Johanadab, belonging to the Ken Knights. Connected with Israel through Moses' marriage. Jeremiah 35. Then I set up before the sons of the house of Rechabites bowls, bowls full of wine and cups and said to them, Drink wine. They were invited by the holy prophet of God, Jeremiah, to partake in wine in consecrated room in the very temple of God. And they still turned down the wine because of a promise that they made. To their father Rekah not to drink wine. That was their family thing. And even when they sat amongst the priests with Jeremiah, the holy prophet, in the temple of God, Creator, Hawa, the Rechabites had taken a vow to obey the commands of their forefather, and no matter the setting of the circumstances, they remained true to their commitment. So these Kenites, if they are Cain, they had a connection to the creator. Remember Cain still was given a mark. Specifically so he's not slayed. Anyone who touches Cain gets it seven times over. So there might be a seed that the creator is rocking with as well. And this might be what we're talking with the Kenites. This is kind of small. You see it down here. We're just talking about the house of Rechab. First Chronicles 2.55. It is stated that a certain people of Jabez and Judah were the Kenites that came of Hamad. So of Jabez and Judah. So in the tents of Judah, there still were the Kenites that came of of Hamath, the father of the house of Rechab. It is clear from these passages that the Rechabites were a people who endeavored to resist the customs of settled life in Palestine 
by remaining the nomadic ideal. They existed at a different at different times in both the northern and southern kingdoms. So these kins or this seed of Cain or however it connects with the Midianites and Jethro or Reuel. They were nomadic. They had a, a sovereign connection with their creator and they didn't even drink any wine or any strong drink or live in houses or sow seed or plant vineyards and had enjoyed themselves to dwell in tents all their days. Jeremiah used the fidelity of the Rechabites to their principles as an object lesson in his exhortations to his contemporaries. How important were the Rechabites? How important are the Canaanites who dwelled in the North and Southern Kingdom? So this drop here, get it, as we make our dismount, get ready for it, pull this link up and just get a piece of it, you know, he dodged the hijack, you know, he got some thing about the Israelites being white and all that stuff, but let's just focus. Jehu, the new son, the new king of Israel, had just met a man whom he knew, who he knew, but who is a stranger to us, but he met Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, is your heart true to my heart as mine is to yours? They were bonded by their hatred of Baal worship. Right? Just like the tribes of Moses. Also nomadic, right? Tribes of Moses, priesthood. Too exalted for the possession of territory in biblical times were not one of the twelve tribes among whom Joshua divided up the land of Canaan. They were something else. They were Canaanites. They were, you know, Abyssinian mixed multitude of these Canaanites, Jethro's people, or the Midianites. Remember, Yannis means that you're fleeing from idol worship. Yannis, Yannis, fleeing from idol worship. Let's go. They are bound by the hatred of Baal worship. Jehonadab's ancestry appears to go back 600 years in the story of the Midianites slash Canaanites. Non-Israelites who were adopted into Israel and lived among them and yet apart from them in the Astor, Astor, story pastoral life. And that's why we're reading about these pastors of the Canaanites. Moses was keeping his flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. <laughs> so these Midianites and Kenites are interchangeable. Moses had escaped from Egypt after killing an Egyptian and had lived 40 years as a shepherd. Well, we about to get back in the book of Jasher for the dismount, and he was king of Cush for 40 years. Any coincidence? Why would the book of Jasher say he was king of Cush for 40 years? And here it says he was 40 years a shepherd, working for his father-in-law. God soon called him back to Egypt to liberate his people. Okay, okay. Because in the book of Jasher, he's called Reuel, not Jethro. Reuel, the Midianite, father-in-law of Moses. Okay. So he invited Hobab, son of Jethro. Another link here is going to say Hobab is also another name of Jethro. To the promised land, this is where the mixed Abyssinian, this is where this comes into play. Because <coughs> we connected this with Cush, Moses being the king of Cush. Connected it to Ethiopia, Abyssinia. To the Rechabites, the Kenites. They surfed away. And we're just talking Khan. We're just talking priest in Hebrew. Priest. We're just talking the tribes of Moses. Too exalted for possession of territory in biblical times. I'm just saying over and over again, remember the Rechabites, man.
the descendants of Rekah through Jahana, Jahan Dab or Jahanadab, they belong to the Kenites who accompanied the children of Israel into Palestine and dwelt among them. Moses married a Kenite wife, Judges 1 and 16, and Yael was the wife of Heber the Kenite. Saul also showed kindness to the Kenites in 1 Samuel 15. The main body of the Kenites dwelt in cities and adopted settled habits of life, but Jehonadab forbade his descendants to drink wine or live in the cities. Swag frequency, baby. That's right, man. They were commanded to lead always a nomad life. Too exalted for the possession of territory in biblical times are all these tribes of Moses. Remember, Moses is a priest king. And this is why this investigation for us is prime time because you're always digging on a Prester John and it puts you back into your timeline. We're just talking twenty second year of reign of Moses over the children of Cus. Latinus reigned over the children of Chittim forty five years. So you're talking about Edom, right? And you're talking about someone named Latinus, which is where they're probably getting Latin from, right? And Latinos assembled his forces, and they came in ships, and went therein to fight Azrubu, son of Angus, king of Africa. And they came to Africa and engaged in battle with Azumbal and his army, and Latinos prevailed over Azumbal. And Latinos took Azumbal, the aqueduct which his father had brought from the children of Shittim. And this was Latinus, the king of Shittim. What does it got to do with Latin? <laughs> I mean, I've never seen it put like that before. What's it got to do with Latin? And Moses, the son of Amram, was still king in the land of Cush in those days. And he proposed, he prospered in his kingdom. And he conducted the government of the children of Cush in justice, righteousness, and integrity. So before the children of Israel had Moses all to themselves, he was ruling the Cush, the Cushite. In the 40th year of the reign of Moses over Cush, Moses was sitting in the royal throne. While Adana, the queen, was before him and all the nobles were sitting around. And the Don the Queen said before the king and princes, What is this thing with you the children of Cush have done for for this time, long time? Surely you know that for 40 years this man has reigned over Cush. He has not approached me. Because she was the seed of Ham. Nor has he served the gods of the children of Cush. So what happens? Moses ends up separating. All right, they rose up Menelkrus, son of Kilkianus, had to be the new king, but they still gave Moses an honorable discharge. But the children of Cush gave many presents to Moses and sent him, sent him from them with great honor. Then we got where he was thrown in a dungeon. <laughs> he was thrown in a dungeon by Reuel, his future father-in-law, right? We're going to get back into this attic, attic com pharaoh that was rocking at this time. I mean, you know, I'm just bringing this back out so we can, we can connect this because and all the mighty men of the Kenites tried to pluck it when they endeavored to get support. His daughter, they were unsuccessful. They were trying to pluck the what? They were 
were trying to pluck the scepter. What scepter? Give me back my things, right? The sapphire stick, man. And it was that while he prayed, he looked opposite to it. And behold, a sapphire stick was placed in the ground, which was planted in the midst of the garden. And this is after Moses came from the dungeon. Behold, the man Moses was living in the dungeon, standing on his feet. And Reuel commanded Moses to be brought out the dungeon. So they shaved him, changed his prison garments, and ate bread. And then Moses went into the garden of Reuel, Jethro, right, behind the house. And there he prayed to Hawa, who had done mighty wonders for him. And while he was he, he prayed, he looked opposite, and he saw this sapphire stick planted in the ground. He approached the stick and looked, and the name of Hawa was engraved on it. It's the same stick that was used by the stick came down to Noah and was given to Shem and his descendants and came to the hand of Abraham the, he the Hebrew. Then it went to Jacob, then to Joseph. And then after uh, the nobles of Egypt came to the house of Joseph, the stick came to the hand of Reuel the Midianite or the Kenite. And he and went out of and when he went out of Egypt, he took it in his hand, planted it in his garden. And all the mighty men of the Kenites tried to pluck it. All the mighty Kenites, Kenites tried to pluck it. And when they endeavored, they were unsuccessful. When Reuel saw the stick in Moses, in the hand of Moses, he wondered at it, and he gave him his daughter Zipporah as a wife. And that's when Moses married the Kenite. Moses married a Kenite wife. So we're putting it all together to see who the Rechabites are, to connect them to the tribes. So we can see clearly. Pull up this link, we'll get right back in it.